Okay. Can you put that? Oh. <laughs> oh, you're on there. Is that okay? <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Should we move it? <laughs> there we stop. <laughs> okay, good. All right, great. Okay, let me start with your questions. You guys really got the assignment. I'm very happy with the way you did the assignment. That's the idea. Okay, I'm going to go uh, talk about each one of your questions, just so you can see that those were good questions. So Michel does excellent work at the Remes. He immediately sees uh, the bird, the snake, and Lilith as metaphors, right? Which they are. This is not just a story. This, this is, remember, scripture. This is also scripture, like the Hebrew Bible, but it's the scripture of the Sumerians. So we know here, too, there are different layers. And, and this is not just a, a nice story about a woman and a tree and, and a bird, a snake, and this Lilith figure, right? Every single word has a deeper meaning. And so you inquired very well into the remes, right? So, of course, we're going to look at that today. What is the meaning of the snake, the bird, and Lilith, right? So, Rivera... Uh, where's Rivera? Who's Rivera? <laughs> Who's Rivera? This, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Rivera. Uh, very good. You noticed, uh, and uh, this is also part of the uh, remez, you notice that there is a reciprocity between Gilgamesh and Inanna. She gives him something, he gives her something. I want you to take note of this reciprocity because it is the exact, in my view, the exact reciprocity we're going to find in Genesis 3.16. <laughs> we're, we're really, we're doing detective work here. Right? We're going to, my goal in this class is to offer a reading of Genesis 3.16 that is illuminated by this text, right? So if you see a reciprocity between what the woman is giving the man and the man is giving the woman, and you notice uh, rightly that he gives her the bed. Oh, can someone open the door and leave it open? Oh, thank you. So he gives her the bed and the throne, which are metaphors, right? We have to figure that out. And she gives him this strange thing called the puku. What is it? <laughs> Uh, and the miku, right? And you notice that. that um, and we know from other texts, and you can jot this down, the puku and the miku are translated. The, the People are not quite sure because obviously they're working on little tablets, right? I don't know if you've noticed some of these tablets that they're um, translating from. I mean, sometimes it's, is there one here somewhere? <laughs> so you can see the difficulty, right, of the guy who did these translations. They're sometimes dealing with just fragments and sometimes they don't know the words because Sumerian is not a language anymore. I mean, nobody's speaking it. So I'm trying to find here in these images. There, here's one, right? This is what these people are working with, right? <laughs> so, and, and often they don't have, you know, a means of translation because there are no more Sumerians walking around. So they really have to go based on this word resembles that word in Akkadian or that word in Arabic and therefore probably means this, right? So they're working very, it's 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 quite a difficult task. So puku miku is not even translated, but we think it means a rod and a ring uh, in uh, elements of kingship, right? So he gives her a bed and a, uh, what is it, a throne and she gives him a royalty, right? Notice this, so good observation, right? And we'll come back to that. Uh, Corcoran, you, did, you do a very good feminist reading of the Tessie, right? Yeah, good, very good. You're in the drush. You're now looking as a philosopher. You're looking at gender relations and she's not happy with what she sees, right? And, and you're right. There is an element of violence, right? Gilgamesh comes in, tough guy, destroys everything, <laughs> right? I mean, um, she invites him to help. And I mean, she does get in the end of bed, but what is the sacrifice? She goes, right, what destruction has to occur before she emerges uh, with a bed and a throne? So this is, you're asking a question from uh, the experience of a woman, from the feminist backdrop, right? You're looking, you're thinking about gender relations. You're thinking, let me see how the gender relation, what is the balance here? And you perceive an imbalance and you're correct. There is an imbalance. The woman is very, you know, she's crying, you know, her tree's not working out. She's just weeping passively. And then she has to call on the help of men, right? To help her. And then this guy comes in, big tough guy, right? Destroys the tree that she cared for. So you right, so delicately. I mean, certainly you notice, so you see how she's on the trash level. She's coming in now more with philosophical questions and you can do that, right? You can do that and look into the text and see what is there, right? So. You notice know very correctly, and we'll talk about this element of violence. Why is there such violence there? What is the cultural aspect of this violence? And why does she yet emerge, right, with her bed and her throne in spite of the violence? Um, very good. 
Davidov, uh, excellent also, where are you? Uh, right here. <laughs> right, so Davidov also notices the conquest of nature. It's excellent, also. you're coming also with the drash, right? You see how they're coming with, uh, this is not in the text, right? The, the, the remes, you're looking in the text, how the text is written. When you come with outside questions, with outside presuppositions, right? He's coming from philosophy of nature, coming from feminism. You start to see more things. In, so in other words, this is so interesting about scripture. It invites us to come and to wrestle with it from our own perspective. <clears throat> and it is really together that we build the meaning, right? So excellent, the conquest of nature, the tree has to be completely destroyed. Why, and he criticizes that, right? Why is it that uh, in a way her, individuation, right? Her bed and her throne has to come through such destruction. What is the issue? So very nice. Uh, Mendoza, 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 yes. <laughs> okay, good observation. You sense very correctly that Enki is a kind of very authoritarian deity and he holds the keys to the cosmic law, the me, M-E, and then she comes and steals it from him and brings it to mankind. You should be reminded of a Greek story that sounds just the same. You remember? Oh, sure. Which Did one? Sure. Oh, uh, I wasn't thinking about yeah. that. <laughs> Another one. Prometheus. Prometheus steals the fire from the gods and brings it to human beings, right? Same gesture. This, is, By the way, all these cultures borrowed from each other, right? So Prometheus certainly borrowed from this story here, which is more ancient, right? Uh, so good. You, you, you discern very rightly. There is an element of verticality. I, 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 do you remember what I said about the mother's house, right? Vertical versus horizontal. And she spreads the law horizontally, right? So we'll talk about this. this is an important... Um, so you're doing uh, also remes, right? You're, um, are you, yeah, because you're looking at uh, the, the language, cultural background, right? Um, cultural language. Anything that is looking at the text itself, right? without bringing in anything else. Epstein, we need a little more. <laughs> so we'll skip you today. <laughs> and then Suresh, yes, you're doing also, as you're asking, what is the meaning of the tree, right? Okay, so just to give you an idea, right? You see how your questions can all be divided in these four categories. That is what we need to be bringing to the text to make it come alive. All of these layers are there, but they won't be uncovered unless we ask the right questions. And then we get deeper and deeper and the text unfolds. Right. We can have the chat. Oh, a nice girl with, uh, you know, tree, uh, you know, let's go gardening. <laughs> you know, women like gardening. <laughs> I don't know, you know, what we can get on the chat level. But in this text particularly, it remains closed off unless we ask these questions. And that is the case with every scripture. The scripture remains closed off until we begin to engage with the scripture and ask questions and wrestle with it. Okay, so now let's go into the text. Let me introduce to you a little bit, uh, Inanna. And then I will begin to answer, we'll, we'll work together, begin answering these questions. <laughs> okay, so um, first of all, <laughs> now's the time you want to start taking notes. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> okay, first of all, actually, even when I talk about the questions, right, those those are important too. Um, so first of all, why speak of Inanna, right? We The, the class is Plato and the Bible. Plato has been replaced by Inanna, <laughs> right? Why do we go so far back? Why don't we stay with the biblical text, right? Um, well, main reason is this. The mother's house in the biblical context that we talked about, right? These matriarchal texts, these texts that have a matriarchal flavor, they are really coming from that tradition. The, this whole matriarchal spirit started in Sumeria, in Sumer, right? In the empire of Sumer. This is where the Hebrews got their matriarchal fiber. Right later, under the influence of Moses, right things become more and more patriarchal. But originally, if you look at the book of Genesis, it is a powerfully matriarchal text. And where did Abraham come from? Remind me. <laughs> Ur and where is Ur? Mesopotamia. Yes, Sumer. This is one of the big Sumerian cities. Right? We forget this. Abraham is coming from Sumer. He's coming. This is one, one of the main, there are several cities that the Sumerians built. One of them is Babylon, which later is uh, invaded by um, the, the people who will be the ones who conquer Israel later. But uh, this you have Babylon and you have Ur. So we know that there is a strong influence, right? Abraham himself is coming from that culture. So the whole book of Genesis, very matriarchal text. 
you see there's a, always each time a power couple, right? Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and, well, it splits up a little bit <laughs> to women, right? But you have there a very strong balance between the masculine and the feminine until Moses. And there, there is an imbalance, right? Uh, which can be even seen in the personal life of Moses when he separates from his wife, right? And then things become much more patriarchal, much more vertical, and we enter into the father's house. Yes. Because of the, the culture of Egypt and Pharaoh. I want to say that, but Egypt was also very strongly matriarchal, right? So I don't know. I don't know why it turned like that, right? I know Moses himself is a very, there is an imbalance personally, right? So maybe that's the reason, right? He separates from his wife. There's not anymore this power couple dynamic, right? Uh, and, and he is, you know, himself trained to be a pharaoh, right? Trained to be a priest. So maybe uh, I would have to look deeper, right? But Egypt itself was a very, uh, the woman had a very strong place in Egypt, right? So I, it's, I'm curious, <laughs> right? I would have to ask, but that's a really good question, right? Okay, so you have this uh, uh, culture, uh, which is, uh, so, so that's the first element, right? We, borrow, we read these texts because they are the source for, I believe, they are the source for the matriarchal uh, spirit, which is in the biblical text. Um, and there are a lot of connections. And um, whoever wrote the first 11 chapters of Genesis is familiar with these texts and with the Epic of Gilgamesh, because you can see um, same symbols, same stories. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, you have the story of the flood, right? Same idiomatic expressions, right? Um, I, I forgot which one, I would have to reread the Epic of Gilgamesh, but you certainly, they are, they are contemporary to each other. The first 11 chapters of Genesis and these texts are contemporary and they know each other and they borrow from each other. So we need to go there. So let's go there and talk a little bit about Inanna, the goddess Inanna. Okay, so she's, so they had a number of gods, goddesses, just like the Greeks, right? She's one of the big ones. Uh, Sumer, of course, just to give you ge geographical location, you know this, uh, of course, this is ancient Mesopotamia. This is south of Iraq, between the Euphrates and Tigris. Uh, it was a very strong matriarchal culture before, um, before the Semites invaded, right? Uh, you had, you know, women had a lot of rights. They could hold property. Um, they could engage in business. Uh, premarital sex was okay. <laughs> so you had a lot of freedom in um, in the context of Sumer. And then you had these powerful goddesses. So there, there's probably a connection, right, between the freedom that the women had and the gods they worshipped, possibly, right? So later, the Semites invade Sumer. And by the Semites, I don't mean um, Israel necessarily. Um, this is the descendants of Shem, right? In in the in the Hebrew Bible, they invade, and then Inanna changes names. She morphs into Ishtar under the Babylonian Empire, and then later becomes the Canaanite Asherah, which we talked about last time. Okay, so let's look a little bit now. Let's let's give a little more insight in how Inanna belongs, obviously, <laughs> in the mother's house, right? I want to go over these. Again, the same four points we saw last time, or was it five? Let me see, one, two, three, four, five. Five points of the mother's house. Let's see how Inanna fits in, right? Okay, feminine versus masculine. So obviously, right? <laughs> Strong female goddess, right? Um, the, the male in the stories of Inanna, if you've read the whole thing, if you, if you were curious to read the whole thing, very often the male has a secondary role, right? Um, you won't have this in the biblical text. Biblical text is going to create more balance, but in the Sumerian text, the woman, the the goddess, it kind of overwhelms, <laughs> right? She's there's uh, she's definitely the stronger character, right? Um, so you do have a slight imbalance, perhaps. Where not in the story, I agree, Corcoran, <laughs> not in the story, but later she takes more and more power, and Dumuzi becomes more and more and more sort of a pawn, right? Your question, Epstein. Mm -hmm. uh, um she seems a typical of most um, goddesses in in um, polytheistic religions because she holds. If you go look at the title she gets during the whole party shenanigan, she she gets a really long list of titles. Yep. they're like, okay, you get one over here. You're the god of the sun. You're the god over there. You're the god over there, and we're going to give you all of these exactly. Qualities. Exactly. Yeah, she's almost like a, a god, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she's a very ambitious goddess. You can tell, right? She's extremely ambitious. Um, very similar to her counterpart in the Hebrew Bible, Eve, right? There are a lot of connections. I hope you begin to notice the connections between Inanna's personality and Eve's personality. And the Song of Songs, the woman in the Song of Songs, uh, Esther, Ruth. They're all in a way, you, we will see this, they're all in a way drawing from this character, right? Tapping into her charisma, yes. One minor thing I wanted to point out, like the potential connection is that Eve doesn't get her name in the Bible until after she takes from the tree and Inanna here, she's not referred to as Inanna until she plants the tree before that says a woman just took a tree. Oh, wait, really, let me see. Turn with me, tell me, tell us where. Um, that's nice. I like that. Let's see. A woman. Yeah, a woman. Oh, yes. She takes the tree and then becomes Inanna. There's no Inanna before. You're right. Very nice. Okay. So she becomes a woman after she begins to care for the tree. That's interesting. And, and Eve also, right? Individuates after. So I, I want you to begin to see these connections. Because why? Because this text, I, be, I believe, and this is why I want to study this, it illuminates the difficult chapters of uh, Genesis 1 to 3, right? Genesis 1 to 3 are difficult chapters. They have led to a lot of problems in the way they were interpreted. We need to go back and interpret them in the light of these texts. They're they are family texts. They're connected to these texts. So we can illuminate what's going on in Genesis 1 through 3 by reading this. this is why we're doing this. Okay. Going now to vertical versus horizontal. It's interesting with Inanna. So typically in the more male um, father's house, you know, houses of worship, you have the notion of God being very distant, untouchable, and we can only reach God through sacrifice, right? This was not only in the Hebrew religion, this was everywhere. Everybody was doing that, right? Uh, the temple of Marduk later in Babylon, uh, the, the, when, 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 when patriarchy triumphs, right? In that region, it's the same thing, sacrifice. Right? So God is distant, you cannot touch him. You can come near trembling with your sacrifice, right? Here, what happens? What? How do you come into contact with the goddess? It, you, it, she actually marries a human being, right? So Dumuzi is a human being. I mean, he's a powerful one, but he's still a human being. So here you can actually become intimate with the god, right? Which you don't have in the other father's house context. Here in the mother's house, you have the notion which emerges of intimacy with God, which by the way, you find also in the Hebrew Bible, where? A joke. <laughs> where? where? <laughs> the God's interplay, not married, but the interplay between the God and Okay, okay, so they're talking. Yeah, but, but between the interplay with Dan and, and you. Yes, so there's a dialogue, certainly it's closer, but I'm talking about intimacy. Yes. This is the only um, biblical text with God actually having a conversation with somebody. Yes. Or it's just commands. Oh, you're so right. I like that. Yes, absolutely. There's definitely a shift with the book of Job. Uh, but uh, I'm talking here about actual intimacy with God as a lover. Do we, where is this in the Hebrew Bible? Guys. <laughs> Huh? Song of songs. Okay, song of songs number one, but more explicitly, the simplicity there. More explicitly? Uh, oh, so definitely New Testament is developing that metaphor, but you find it already in the Hebrew Bible in the section of, so there's three sections in Hebrew Bible, Pentateuch, writings, and, and how is God described in the prophets? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> right? God is husband. There's a notion of a marriage, right? Covenant marriage between the people of Israel and God. This is, I mean, where is this coming from? This is radical intimacy with God. God is a bridegroom. And then, of course, Christianity develops this idea, right? But, but here it starts out, right? This is a mother's house concept. Right, that God is not the distant. So, of course, God is also distant, right? God is also untouchable. We ought to come to God in fear and trembling with our sacrifices, but God is also the lover, the beloved, the one that we enter in covenant with, right? And we see this. So, you see how here we have a more vertical, a more proximity of God versus the distance of God. And again, I invite you remember, we have to think of these things together. Right, mother's house and father's house. You gotta hear both voices at the same time. Mother's house one year, father's house the other. Year. Right, we can't have just proximity with God. Otherwise, God becomes, you know, it's not God. 
right? So this is the, the tension we have to retain. God is yet is super far and yet super close, right? Um, very nice. So then uh, law and wisdom. So I was thinking about that this morning. I was like, oh, when she does go and steal the, uh, let me write this down. This is in the other story. I don't know if you read it. The story where she steals wisdom from Enki called the myth, Egyptian, Mount, Hebrew, what is it? What, what's the same concept in the Hebrew tradition? Which word is English? In, in Hebrew. Uh, das. Huh? Das. The what? Das. Das. Uh, yes, or, you know, Torah, whatever, the law, right? Which uh, holds the law in Hebrew. A law. A law. Halakha. 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 Is that what you were saying? Halakha. And then in the Greek, which now come back to philosophy, the nomos. You have this concept in every tradition of a cosmic life. Right, uh, and basically the idea that we find here with uh, Inanna in the second story where she is stealing the cosmic law from Enki. Uh, the, the belief was that this law, which you find everywhere in the ancient world, without this law, we cannot have civilization, right? There needs to be certain framework, certain restrictions, certain limitations in order to keep chaos at bay. This was fundamental. Uh, this was why the law was so important. And then later the Roman law, right? The, the Lex. Um, so you have this notion that uh, in the ancient world, there was a strong sense that the, the forces of chaos were right there, waiting to seep back into the world, right? And the only way to keep these demonic forces at bay was to have this law, this kind of, you know, a structure which, uh, which created order within chaos, which created the civilization, right? So... So in, in the story, it's up there held by this male god and she goes and snatches it, right? And gives it to the people. So I was thinking, oh, this is interesting. In my distinction, mother's house, we have law versus wisdom. Remember, we talked about this. So what is it, law or wisdom? And then I realized she takes the law and distributes it to the people. That is wisdom. Wisdom is the law given, the law embedded in reality. The law transfigured by a... Uh, by reality. In other words, you have two types of law. <laughs> Aristotle does a good job of explaining this. You have the law in the heavens, the ideal that we should try to reach. This is the vertical and key, right? And then you have the law softened, cultivated, made accessible to human beings. And that is wisdom. Do you follow? Right? Wisdom is the law softened, is the law kind of grind, you grind, like you take wheat and you grind it and you knead it and you bake it and then you offer it to the people. That's wisdom. Yes. It is us being stolen. <laughs> They're having a drinking contest. She, she's a better drinker. Yeah, she's a great drinker. She's, she's this, woman, <laughs> this woman defies all, <laughs> all stereotypes, right? So, We're going to talk about so that. It's, it's not she knows what she's doing while he doesn't know what he's doing because he's drunk. <laughs> exactly. She really gets it. So that's the idea, right? She, yeah, first of all, she's, she's some, she's, she's a, a, you know, wild type of a woman, very strong woman again, right? The imbalance, you see it again. She just overpowers all the men of her life, except Gilgamesh, but this is early when she's still young. Uh, so, so she is really an overpowering figure for sure. But the idea here I want you to jot down is that the law, when it is softened and made accessible to the common mortal, this is what is called wisdom. So when we talk about wisdom in the mother's house, we are not going against the law. We are talking about the same law, but we're talking about that law when it has been ground to a fine powder, kneaded into a bread and baked and then offered. Do you see the difference? Uh, I, here's the way Aristotle puts it, and I think it's even clearer. Aristotle used to say this. You have the ideal, Platonic ideal. It's like a ray of light, right? Which comes into the water. Water is our reality, right? It's a metaphor for our reality. What happens when a ray of light enters water? Physics majors? Rainbow. No? no. <laughs> Not, uh, what? Disperses. Uh, it, it, more it specifically? Huh? It refracts. It changes a little bit, right? So it's not, it's when, as soon as it hits water, it shifts. It becomes, it, 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 it bends. Wisdom is the bending of the law as it enters human reality. It's still the law, it's still the same sun ray. It's still the same, but it bends. And so it looks different, right? 
That is what is wisdom. And the mother's house is doing this. It's taking the high ideal, bending it so that human beings can digest it, can, uh, you know, uh, will not die from it, right? Imagine if you have too pure of a law, who can follow this, <laughs> right? So wisdom kind of, you know, there's a beautiful story in the Talmud again, where it says um, the Torah or the Jewish um, law is you can't, it's like a grain of wheat that if you just eat the wheat, I mean, you're going to blow, it. <laughs> it's not going to be good for your digestive system. You have to first grind it to a fine powder and then you have to add water and knead it. And then you have to bake it and then you offer it. And this says Jewish tradition is the oral tradition. So you have the written law from God, very powerful, luminous, idealistic, but then oral tradition, which is a tradition of wisdom makes it into something palatable. Are you following me? So that's the idea here, right? So that's how I see her still. She is the she's stealing the law, but to make it <laughs> into wisdom, right? Okay, I, I want to hurry uh, through this because I want to get into the text. Um, separation versus integration. Inanna is herself an outcast, right? She doesn't fit into the category, cultural norms of the time, right? When you learn more about her, you learn a lot of crazy things. In the next story that we're going to study, with which is her marriage to Dumuzi, I don't know if you read it, but. Um, there's a whole set of, of um, tasks that um, her brother is saying, I'm going to do for you. I'm going to cut the flax. I'm going to whatever. I don't even know how this works. <laughs> I've never, right. All the steps of weaving a flax into a linen, right? Mm -hmm. And this is typically the task of the woman. Proverbs 31, what does the woman do? She's doing this, right? So what is she doing? She said, I, I ain't doing that. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I won't be caught dead doing that. That's that's women's work. I'm not that, right? So you see already how she doesn't fit into the stereotype of a woman. She won't do woman's work, right? Another thing with Inanna, she's not married and she has no kids, right? She's not interested in being married or having kids. She doesn't fit into the social norms, right? And another thing with her, she has many lovers. By the way, later in the epic of Gilgamesh, she pops up again. But in that epic, he completely despises her because she has too many lovers, right? He calls her a slut. Oh, <laughs> Ishtar. So, yeah, in the epic of Gilgamesh. Do you, have you read it? Yeah, That's, he really despises her. Even though here in this text, he is, they, he is her, her first lover, right? But clearly he's gotten, he's gotten over her. <laughs> he's bitter about it. Despise. He's bitter, yeah. <laughs> he's bitter. He despise her. There's a whole like tablet of Enkidu and Gilgamesh is cussing her out. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, sure. exactly. So that's, so that's the second thing, where she's, she's promiscuous, she has many lovers. Sure. And she, because of this, she became the patron saint of, well, let me explain this a little bit. In the culture of Sumer, there were two types of women. There was the woman who was a homemaker, very similar to Greece, Hera, the homemaker, and Athena, <laughs> the wild one. Um, she's like that. She's the correspondent of Athena. So she, so there was the homemaker, and then there was the woman who was single, who had a kind of a free lifestyle, and she was in charge of what we call taverns. So these were uh, pubs. You know, people would go there to to drink or socialize, or maybe foreigners would walk by and so forth. And um, so these women were single, had kind of a wild life, and she was the patron saint of those women, right? So. So she was kind of an outcast. She's on. She's she corresponds in the book of Proverbs to the foreign woman, right? And in many ways mirrors the woman in the Song of Songs, who herself is an outcast on the margins of society, not married, no kids, right? The very a lot of similarities between the two figures, right? So uh, she's restless, right? She's called the one who walks about, <laughs> can't sit down, can't settle down. And she's a warrior goddess. And we'll come back to this military aspect because we'll find this also in the Hebrew Bible. So I hope you get a good portrait, right, of Inanna. Uh, last point, doing versus receiving. So here, very clearly for the king, right, the, the, the king, uh, uh, actually, you don't know this, but um, the main uh, way that Inanna was worshipped or appreciated as a goddess was so she was considered to be the goddess of fertility of life of nature and so what would happen is um so of course she weds we'll see this she she she, she marries Dumuzi who's a human being and so every year 
the Sumerians would reenact this uh, marriage, right? And and this would happen, of course, Inanna is no more <laughs> wandering around. This is way in the ancient past, but they would take the priestess of Inanna and this priestess would sleep with the king of the land, either symbolically or for real, we don't know, right? We like to think it was for real, but sometimes uh, people believe they just took a statue of the goddess, whatever. So, it, but you know, it could have been real. So she would sleep with the king, and then out of this, the king would emerge empowered to rule, and then Inanna would emerge empowered to be fertile, and whole nature would come alive. It was a ritual that occurred in autumn when things begin to bloom in the ancient Near East, right? So, um, so in this context, we see that the king receives his power from the goddess. He cannot become a tough guy through battle and then become king through his prowesses and his achievements, right? He becomes king through contact with the goddess. I want you to circle that very, very bigly. <laughs> like what's his name? Invented that word, Trump, right? Bigly. I want you to circle that very strongly because Genesis 3.16 is the exact replication of this. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm preparing you. Okay. So he receives, right, there is a notion of receptivity. The king has to be the recept re receptive in order to become king. He can't be this macho guy, right, who, who made himself king, right? You got You receive the power from the goddess. So that's, and we'll talk about this uh, more next time. Okay, any questions on this amazing woman? <laughs> who is that, the, who is in fact, in my view, the, the figure which hides behind all of these powerful women of the Bible. They all share the traits of Inanna in some way, right? The biblical writers are drawing from this tradition, of course, modifying it, transmuting it, saying, you know, in a context of monotheism, right? It won't be, there's no goddess in the Hebrew Bible, but the women that are there really resemble Inanna. <laughs> I mean, it's very clear. Uh, okay, any questions on this? Anything? Okay, let's get into our text. The truth. Turn with me to the Hulupu tree. I'm going to work on this together. Okay, this is this is such a great story because it ushers us right into Genesis 2 and 3, right? Same thing. So we're going to study uh, Genesis 2 and 3 next, but I wanted you to see the, the most ancient version of it, right? This is the one of the oldest stories that's about a woman and a tree. <laughs> okay. So let's let's go a little bit into uh, this this story and try to analyze the metaphors together and see what we can learn. We're gonna do some drash. We can't do much remez. I don't know the language. <laughs> Neither do you. But we'll do some drash. So thank you for observing this. First thing we observe: she's a woman until she plants the tree. In a way, the tree is the beginning of her individuation. It's interesting. Okay. Now, what does the tree mean? Anybody have any ideas? What does the tree, yes? It could be uh, wisdom. It's the first instance of giving her a wisdom. Where do you see that? Tell me from the text. Well, no, I'm making an allegory to every other tree in every other mythical. Ah, okay. Uh, so another. Okay. Things like the tree of knowledge or the Yggdrasil or. Okay. Uh, there's, there's one other one that I can't think of. Good, good, good. So you're looking at other cultures, what the tree means. So he's doing remes, right? He can't. <laughs> we have other cultures, right? So you're right. There is an element of wisdom. And we have the bird there who is in that tree, right? Um, what else can the tree mean? It also means something else, um, which is very important to understand Inanna. She's closely connected to the tree. It's almost as if the, as if the tree is a, an embodiment of her spirit, right? Uh, I, I would say they're identified in the text. Whatever happens to the tree is happening to Inanna, right? I, I, I think the tree is a metaphor. I think, we, I mean, we can definitely uh, gather from the text because later you carve a throne and a bed and this is womanhood, right? This is, these are elements of womanhood. So I, I, I'm gonna argue that the tree is, is, is her, <laughs> right? Represents her womanhood. Now, tree also in the ancient Near East was symbol of life. And we have the equivalent in the Hebrew Bible, the tree of life, right? But in uh, I, I did a short search on Wikipedia and I read a little bit into different cultures, what this tree means, this great, I mean, it's called the tree of life, right? You see those um, jewelries, right? With, you have the tree. <laughs> so you definitely also symbolize life, immortality. And it's connected, identified with the woman. Uh, we have to know that for ancient, these ancient cultures, the woman was a spectacular creature. 
because she was the only one who could give life. I mean, and so a lot of people worshipped the woman in the sense that she seemed to have a connection to the gods in that sense, right? Because she, like the gods, was able to give, to create new life, right? So so definitely the woman was honored, at least, and if not worshipped, because of this element of life, right? So so the tree can also be associated with life, right? Um, okay, and it's interesting, like you said, uh, after the tree, she is named. Same thing in the... Genesis story. Now, so she here she is. Yes. Is it also a symbol of her emerging power? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We'll see that with the bed and the throne. So this is the, her emerging womanhood, I would say. The tree signifies her womanhood as it emerges. If we know this, we will we will understand everything that's happening, right? Okay. So she's tending to her womanhood, right? She's growing as a woman. And then all of a sudden, what happens? The tree is corrupted. And we have these three figures that appear on the scene the snake the bird and lilith of all people okay anybody have any ideas what the snake represents <laughs> the hebrew bible is a bad guy but uh, not so much in the ancient near eastern cultures what does the snake represent and you can draw on other cultures because they all kind of seem to share a common um a common source so it might be illuminating to borrow even from india or china chinese concept of the snake what could the snake represent? Here it's seen as a problem. Chaos. Huh? Chaos. Okay, yes, snake can be a creature of chaos because the snake was believed to move between uh, chaos and order. The snake was a liminal creature. So yes, the snake seems to be the guardian of chaos. And here he is, right? Uh, chaos is about to break free. Uh, what else? Yeah. Uh, the change for the shedding of the skin. Yes, transformation, immortality. You have this notion of the snake as a reap. So maybe here she's sensing the changes. She is at puberty, perhaps, right? There are changes happening, forces of chaos emerging. If you're a woman and you went through puberty, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Men too. <laughs> puberty is chaos. Right? So the snake certainly, right, is a very good metaphor of what is going on at, around puberty time, right? Uh, what else? Any other ideas for the snake? Um, the snake, just to add, was also the guardian of the realm of the gods. Before the temples in the ancient Near East, they would put cobras, right, which would guard the temple. So the snake is also the guardian of the abode of the gods, right? So in a way, the snake here is now connected to divinity or to the gateway into divinity. Are you seeing connections with Genesis 3? What connection? <laughs> Where is Eve uh, in terms of the gateway to divinity? What does the snake tell her? She eat the apple. And then what will happen? She eat the apple and everything just change. She and turn into a, a human per se. More, 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 more than a human, yes. She will eat the fruit and become like a god. Exactly, only the snake can give her that because he is the guardian. The snake is the guardian of the realm of the gods. So the snake can be, hey, if you follow me, <laughs> I will open this. So, so more than becoming a human, she can become a god, right? Same thing here. There's the notion of divinity that is floated in the air, right? The desire for divinity is there. It's like with the medical symbol, the caduceus that comes from the Greek, that to envelop the snake, so the healing powers of the gods. Yes, exactly. The power, right? So power too, right? So notice how the tree, she is in a way, what is going on is her inner struggle with divinity, with power, right? She's, there is a certain restlessness there, right? She's longing for divinity. She, this is typically Nana. I mean, you see how, how she enjoys power, right? She's longing here for divinity. The snake is the gateway to that. She's longing for power, the powers of healing and so forth. So good. The bird, nobody probably, I had to research that one. So I don't, anybody have any idea or should I just tell you what I thought <laughs> for the uncle bird? Um, so I read, um, so I researched it and found that the uncle bird also tried to steal the myth, the law, right? Um, uh, unsuccessfully. So there's also, the uncle bird could, re could represent the quest for wisdom, right? You should be seeing, hearing in your ear, Genesis 3. What else did Eve covet at the tree? So she wanted to be like God. That was the snake. What else did she see in the tree? It says that she looked at it and saw that it was an attractive means of gaining wisdom. Exactly. So same thing, right? This is the same temptation, the same. They're faced with the same, you know, longing. 
And then, of course, Lilith, um, in the Sumerian tradition, we have not found any writings about Lilith, so we have to go outside, <laughs> right? Lilith is prominent in the Jewish tradition as a kind of restless she-demon, <laughs> right? Who is, has a kind of all wild, unbridled sexuality, right? So very similar to... So here there's an element of chaos, perhaps. Lilith is also represented um, in the Jewish tradition as Adam's first wife. <laughs> but this wife was discarded. Anybody know why? <laughs> what did she do? Yeah, she was like, you know, she refused to submit. <laughs> Adam was like, you will submit to me. She's like, why? We're made of the same thing. Why should I submit to you? And so Adam, you know, discarded her. So she's kind of the, you know, the, the first feminist of the of the of the Hebrew Bible, perhaps, right? Not not the Hebrew Bible, but the Jewish tradition. So, so you see how here there is a definitely a struggle. There's something going on which is dark, right? Uh, and which has to do, uh, I guess, uh, perhaps maybe I should ask you. Now that you know the meanings of the three creatures that are in the tree, can you interpret? what she's struggling with here what how what's your conclusion what is she struggling with here that the, the text is warning us right this is a dark struggle this is a struggle with the dark side what is it what is what's the what is the issue here that she's dealing with and that she feels helpless towards right how would you summarize her struggle <clears throat> Like I feel like she's kind of struggling with balancing being a goddess and also being like this human kind of. Oh, okay, interesting. So she's torn between her humanity and her, you know, desire for divinity, right? So it's very a tension, right, between I'm earth, but I'm also spirit, and how do I, you know, and I want more spirit <laughs> and so forth. Okay, very nice. I like that. Anybody else want to? There's no right and wrong. It's scripture. I mean, there is wrong, but. You got to stick to the text, you, but you can say the, multiple things with, with with the same text. What else do you think she's struggling with? Yes. Separation of chaos from order. Okay, definitely. There's an element of chaos entering her, and she's trying to, you know, restrain it. She's trying to, she wants civilization, the bed and the throne, right? The elements of civilization, but yet there is strong chaos inhabiting her. Anything else? Very nice. Anything else that you're sensing? Uh, is her essence of her struggle here that you could find uh, again that we will find again with Eve same struggle mm. uh, one of the ways that uh, when I researched this uh, in fact in the introduction here of this book or I think no in the interpretation if you read some of the, inter the commentary um, she uh, so this the lady who comments um, Diane Volkstein says something very interesting she says here these are the kind of controlling aspects right these are all aspects of i want to have i want to take i want to get right i want to be more than i am right i want to this is elements of grasping beyond yourself right something that this is the elements of a uh, greed right ambition so here we have almost like the issue here is her kind of trying to grasp at something which is not supposed to be her she's grasping at divinity She's grasping at wisdom. She's grasping at control, right? So this in a way, so Volkstein says, I, I kind of like her interpretation. She says she has to release that controlling attitude in order to have her bed and her throne, right? So what she's reaching for is not going to serve her. Similar to the biblical text, right? Let me say that again, what she's reaching for is not going to serve her. She has to overcome that urge before she can then have her bed and her throne, which are the elements of her feminine individuation. What does the bed represent? Marriage, right? And throne? Ouch. Her queenship, right? So this is her feminine power, right? But there is an obstacle, and the obstacle is this kind of reaching, right? Grasping, wanting power, right? This is the... All three, right? The snake, the bird, and Lilith are elements of power that she's grasping for. So it's as though we're learning from the text, as long as she's grasping for power, she will not individuate in her true femininity, right? The, she's she's missing the point by doing that, perhaps, right? Now, what do you think about that? I'm giving a very uh, biblical interpretation. Um, you might disagree. <laughs> Anybody disagree? Corcoran, you're our feminist. What do you think? <laughs> 
Um, not, not sure about the um her overcoming her urge because I'm not entirely sure how she overcomes her urge. Like if we had a story. Well, the gig got missed. That's him. That's him. Right? Yeah, that's she true. Doesn't, she doesn't that's true. She doesn't. So she doesn't. In fact, she remains a very powerful deity, right? She continues. She steals the myth, right? She so she never. You're right. She never really overcomes that, right? The text is shedding. Is how do you put it? Uh, putting shade. How do you say it in, in your American dialect? Throwing shade. Putting what? Throwing shade. The text is throwing shade, right? At her desire to be, you know, a goddess and everything, but. Is it necessary? Is it so bad, right? You could ask. I, I think you should. <laughs> well, I don't know if I agree with that. Oh, yeah. With what? Like, like the ambition. Like, like, oh, you don't agree with it? I guess, like, in that tradition, like, to, to want more would be, you know, um, yeah. it's discouraged, but I don't know. I find it. You like it. Admirable. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Absolutely. Right. So we can totally go there, right? That in a way, these are legitimate desires, right? That the text. You know, maybe this is the return of patriarchy. Like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah. hold still now, <laughs> right? So, so absolutely. You see how we can look at the text differently, right? We can totally do that. Even we can look at the story of Eve differently, right? We'll have to do that too. I saw a hand floating around. Where was it? Was it you? And then I, okay. you first, or yeah. Here you go. I, I think there's also a part where she's starting to learn the value of patience. Mm. That she she's. That, that she's learning that you can't get it all at once. Okay, okay, yeah, there's a kind and of- And that you have to use, <laughs> utilize others to get what you want as well. Okay, so there's you know, like this she, is important. Because going to her brother isn't just because she she can't take an axe to the tree. Okay, very good. We don't know whether she could take an axe to the tree. That's a very good point. But she utilizes somebody else to get to her to get to yes. the goal. And this is very, very typical of ancient Near East and biblical literature. You cannot individuate alone. Make sure you write this down because we'll see this over and over again. Here she needs the other to come into her full womanhood. It happens very recklessly, right? We'll talk about why. But here you already have the beginning of this idea that we will find throughout the biblical text. We cannot individuate apart from the other. It is the other that awakens us and we awaken the other. Right, the the subject individuates in relationship, doesn't individuate alone like the Western self. Right, the Western self goes to college, gets a career, builds a house. I am individuated. No, <laughs> right, you can't individuate, become fully yourself, blossom fully as a human being unless there has been another who has awakened you. Right, so this is what we're learning here now. Anybody have any idea what the violence of this encounter? signifies with Gilgamesh. It's very violent. Takes an axe. Bah! <laughs> she still emerges, full-fledged woman, right? Next scene is she's contemplating, you know, her womanhood. So yes. So I was gonna have to say this earlier, but I'm glad you brought up the violence that I actually agree with her. I'm sorry, with the Corcoran. Corcoran. Okay, so. <laughs> 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 oh, going by last name. Yes. I guess. <laughs> so I agree with Corcoran that I don't see this as necessarily her rejecting the concept of control and i would say that by fighting these symbols of control she's not rejecting control she's becoming more controlling of them than that so it's not a rejection of the concept it's more of a victory in the same vein and i think that's exemplified by the violence that you point out is that they destroy the tree and she sends like this warrior to go out and do these things for her right but what's interesting is she emerges with her bed and throw i find that really interesting right he doesn't destroy her womanhood he I mean, recklessly and violently individuates her. Let, let me give you the cultural background so you see what's going on. <laughs> it's like, what? In the, I mean, none of this is verifiable, obviously. These are, we, we can only speculate a little bit about these ancient cultures, but there is a whole um, school of thought which said that women in these times, uh, before they got married, were initiated in the temple of Inanna. So any young woman who was about to get married before she slept with her husband would first go into the temple 
And then whatever stranger came by would initiate her. I mean, it's extremely violent <laughs> form of initiation, right? Because if you don't know this man, I mean, hopefully it was done in a setting where, you know, it was a very sacred setting and so forth. So there was this idea of, of brutal initiation before marriage, right? Through which you became a woman. And then once you're a woman, you get married, right? Now you have something to offer, right? So, so this might be what it is alluding to, right? This kind of brutal initiation of young Inanna, right? She's very young here still. Um, but then, interestingly, she emerges, right, full-fledged. So we might question the, the, <laughs> the technique here. The idea I am retaining from this somewhat violent encounter with Gilgamesh, who is kind of a brute, um, as we see later in the epic of Gilgamesh, <laughs> right, is the notion of relationality. In other words, you individuate at the contact of another, right? This is what I'll remember. And he, by the way, also enters into his full-fledged manhood at her contact. This is what I retain, right? Through their interaction, even though it's a violent interaction, he emerges a king and she emerges a woman, right? So there's an element here of we cannot become fully ourselves until we interact closely, right? Um, with another uh, and which we will find over and over again the next uh, scene will be a little better because it's her marriage now she there's none of this kind of violent encounter it's going to be much more beautiful and explicit <laughs> but um this is already x-rated as soon as you enter the class i apologize for the delicate sensibilities in the classroom but the elements that are in the tree in certain represent certain power and that the way you overcome power is with greater force with greater power yeah or they represent uh, they're power, power dark forces there. yeah they're part but they're seen as chaotic right yeah, but to defeat those power forces that are chaotic yeah <clears throat> You, you have to exercise greater force. But she greater doesn't. Power. It's Gilgamesh, well, right? Has, she has a surrogate. <laughs> she, okay, okay. So you're seeing that like that. Okay, she so you're interpreting like that. that. Okay, very nice. So he represents maybe her super ego who comes and controls the situation. So you can you can say that too. Yeah. I, I prefer to see it as an outsider, really, because of the notion of individuation through the other, right? Which is prevalent in, in the... Okay. Any last questions before we, we finish? Okay. So good. So now you should have some good tools to read Genesis 3, which we'll read in a few weeks. Next time, I want you to read her marriage to Dumuz. Yeah, I think you have... A, that's the next... Um, so read that section, the marriage to Dumuzi. I have class. Yeah, we're leaving. <laughs> Did you have class immediately now? At, at... Ah, good. We're, we're gone. We're gone. <laughs> okay, good. So we should leave quickly. Already, we're not supposed to be here. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, you read the marriage to the Mutsi, you do the reading assignment, and we will meet next week. Hello. Yes. <laughs> now, everything is recorded as a Can you give me my. <laughs> That's good to see. Everything is recorded. So.